So a question that I've been asked a lot, and it's very understandable, uh, is in regard to the vaccine, who is next? Uh, what's, what's going to happen? And so today I'm going to try to uh, outline that a little bit. We don't have all the details. We don't have all the timeline. But I felt it was important to share this with you just as soon as we had this information. And we've consulted a lot of people, listened to a lot of people, uh, listened to the medical uh, experts and specialists. Uh, everyone in Ohio uh, who wants to get this vaccine will at some point be able to get it. We just, they just can't get it all today to state the obvious. Um, what we hope is that there will be additional companies come online. Uh, we have two now, um, Moderna and Pfizer. We hope there's more. Uh, we hope that Pfizer and Moderna continue to pump up their, uh, their production as well. And so we will keep you informed as what is coming into the state. Uh, we've been promised a steady flow, but it means that it's going to be months before everybody will be able to receive the vaccine. So we've had to make some difficult uh, decisions, but we've been guided in this by a desire and a, I believe a moral imperative to save as many lives as we can and to do this as quickly as we can. We're now, uh, as you know, in what we describe as phase 1A, and you saw people being vaccinated uh, on TV live today all over the state of Ohio, and that will continue um, in, the days, in the days ahead. Uh, just to recap, who is it that's being, um, getting vaccines now? It's our frontline uh, healthcare workers uh, is, is one large group. Uh, Next group is the congregate care, people in congregate care settings. Why did we pick those two? And I think most states have done this, and I think it's consistent with what CDC has said. We picked those two groups because our frontline medical people need to be protected. They are protecting us every single day. And we need to, we need to protect them. We need them out there. And that's why they're in this first group. In addition to that, we are seeing our heaviest losses in our nursing homes and in other congregate care settings. So we are starting with our nursing homes where the risk is the highest. And then we're moving to other congregate care settings where people are living together and where we know when it comes in, it spreads very quickly. And where we also know that many, many of the cases, these are individuals who um, or, you know, have a higher mortality rate uh, than others might. So that's, that's what you're seeing happen today. It's not going to be done, <laughs> you know, overnight. It's going to take weeks and weeks to do it, uh, but we have the process in place uh, to, get, to get that job done. And we have people out there who are doing this. We have, for example, our health departments who are getting vaccines. They're now working with EMS, as just as one example. They're working with some other kind of care settings. Uh, in addition to that, we have the four uh, pharmacy companies that are out there every day uh, that are vaccinating, uh, giving vaccines to residents and to uh, workers uh, in our long-term care facilities. So they're moving forward. You're also seeing our hospitals uh, and each day more hospitals get the vaccine and they're vaccinating those people who work in that hospital and work for them uh, who are on the, on the front line. So that's where we are today. Uh, what is the next step? Again, the goal, uh, I believe, must be. Uh, I think it's, it's just imperative that we do everything that we can to save lives. Um, we've consulted medical professionals. We've consulted uh, a, a lot of people. And we've looked at a lot of data. So, Eric, could you put the slide up, please? Uh, this is a slide which shows mortality in Ohio from COVID by age. And starting at the bottom, those 80 years old and over represent almost 53% of all deaths in the state of Ohio. 75 to 79 represents 14% of the deaths in Ohio. Those age 70 to 74 represent 12% and those aged 65 to 69, 
5.8%. Uh, that totals up to 86.8% of the population of the state, of, of excuse me, 86.8% of all those who have died from COVID. So those over 60, 65 up uh, comprise almost 67, almost 87% of the deaths in the state of Ohio. It really is an, an astounding, astounding figure uh, when, you, when you look at that. Um, that represents um, approximately that group, 1.8 million Ohioans. And we looked at, you know, where to make, where to draw the line. Uh, and it was clear that this is the most at risk group. Obviously, the older you are, the more at risk uh, you are. So this group will be in the next, in the next group. Um, the rest of the decision is logistics. Uh, you know, whether we roll this out, frankly, uh, in starting at this group and then this group or this group, or whether they are lumped together, we have not figured that out yet. But that really is a basis. The question that we, our team is looking at right now uh, is, how is the best way to get this out as quickly as we can to the most people who are in, in that category. So we'll have more information. I wish we had it today, we don't, but we'll have more information. As soon as we get that information, uh, we will be able to share that with you. Um, we also have a smaller group, uh, a very, very small group of, of people who are under 65. But they're younger people, uh, not always young, but younger than 65, with severe inherited or developmental uh, disorders. Um, sickle cell disease, for example, would be one example. Down syndrome would be another one. And there are a number of them, and we will list those out. But again, based on what the medical professionals have told us, these are individuals who are at a very, very high risk uh, if they would get the COVID. And it made sense with our goal to preserve lives, that we try to preserve their lives and that we give them the opportunity early on in this same group uh, to get the vaccines. Let me move to the third group that is in this new group that we're creating today. School children. We must protect them. And the way we must and we must be able to get them back in school. Now, you know, of course, that CDC has not provided this vaccine can go to anyone 16 or, or under. Um, but the goal is to get these kids back in school. Uh, these children are obviously our future. Uh, these children are Ohio's future. We must invest in our future. We must invest in our children. The latest, latest data shows, uh, as of last week, uh, that 45% of our children in Ohio, in public schools, are now fully remote. 45% are fully remote, not in class at all. 26% uh, of our children in the state of Ohio, our school-age children, K-12, through are partially remote, or what we will call hybrid. That means that 71% of all the children attending public schools in the state of Ohio are not fully in person. And there's many reasons for, for this. Uh, many school, schools have struggled with this. Many have uh, tried to open, were open for a while, uh, and have had problems in keeping kids in class because of quarantining. Some of them had problems in regard to uh, personnel, and they've had some of them, they have had to pull back. That is very understandable. We are in a very difficult, difficult uh, period of time. Some children, uh, when I talk to parents and I talk to educators, it's, it's clear some children do well remotely. Uh, there's probably a small minority that maybe even prefer it and do, do better. Uh, but some do okay. Some do better, some do okay, but there's some who certainly do not do as, as well. Uh, and those are the, particularly the kids that we must worry about. 
Uh, we've had some children who have been remote the entire year, and some of them have done fine, but it's clear that others have not. Um, we've been told by parents, I've been told by parents, by educators, um, that some of these children, because they're out of class, have more mental health problems. Uh, they have more emotional problems. Um, they, they have concerns, the parents do, about their social well, well-being, um, as well as the mental health. That we've also seen, uh, there have been reports, uh, and some clear evidence of this, that absenteeism uh, has gone up among some of these children. So, I want to make it very clear. Um, these are decisions that schools have made, uh, families have made, uh, and they've been made in good, good faith uh, by, by everyone. Uh, but I believe, uh, I believe it's time to get all our children who want to be in class back in class. That is our goal. It is, these kids are our future. Uh, these kids have, have really uh, been hurt in some cases uh, by not being in school. Uh, some of them have become, gotten further behind. And quite candidly, according to the educators that I talked to, some of the children who were already behind now have been most impacted. And they're more, they're further behind than they had been before. So our goal is to get them, all these children, uh, back in school. Uh, the vaccine gives us a tool uh, that schools did not have, uh, that educators did not have, that school boards did not have. And so we're going to make the vaccine available to the schools to accomplish the goal of getting the kids back in school. Now, make it very clear, this decision will always be up to parents. And parents want to make a decision, the child, they feel the child's better off remote, that's fully fully acceptable, that's fine. Parents know what is best for their own children and should make those individual uh, decisions. So we're going to offer vaccines, we're going to offer vaccines to all schools that want to go back or remain in person. So if a school has been out, not been able to go back, not to be in person, if that school uh, makes the decision, we want to go back in person, we then will be able to offer to that school the ability to vaccinate all the adults in the building, the teachers, the bus drivers, the custodians, the people in, in to clerical, anybody who is in that building, uh, people who work in the cafeteria, anybody in that building who will come in contact with children, um, they will be able to get a vaccine. Now, what I cannot tell you today is exactly the date that that is going to occur. Our goal, our goal is to start this phase um, around the middle of January. The subgroups within them, schools included, will be scheduled from there. So we don't know if schools will start on that date or not. But our goal, at a minimum, is for any child in the state that wants to be back in school, to be back in school by March 1st. Now again, many, many schools are already in person. Many are planning to go back in person after the uh, first of the year. So that doesn't inter interfere in anyone's decision, but it is, we believe it's important. I personally believe it's important that parents have this option, that schools have this option, that children have this option to be back in school. Uh, I've heard for the last, you know, nine months uh, about this. And let's, let's keep in mind that these children were not in school in the spring. Um, we accomplished a great deal because state pulled back. Uh, we kept the curve flattened. We saved many, 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 many lives. But it means that they were not in school in the spring. Schools did the best that they could. 
remotely. And we've also seen, based on the, what I just read, that we have a number of children who are not in school uh, today. So we want to provide that opportunity uh, for any school that wants to go back in person or stay in person, that opportunity will be there. Now, we're still working out the details, but again, our goal is to have kids back in school, if the parents want them to be, back by March, March 1st. Let me um, mention one more thing uh, before I turn it over to the uh, Lieutenant Governor. And I mentioned this last week, and again, there's no, no state order on this, but after talking to our health experts a lot about this, um, I want to emphasize something that I said last week, and that is this, that as we look forward to heading back to school after the holidays, um, it's important for schools, for kids, teachers, everyone to get off to a good start. With this in mind, uh, I know that some of our schools are choosing to de delay coming back for a week or so after the new year. I think that's a good idea. And I think I would ask that schools take a look at this. And if that will work for them, I would like for them to do that. Uh, this is based upon what our medical experts have told us. Uh, it is a great way to create a buffer, uh, a buffer between unintended holiday exposures, uh, which may occur in the classroom. And I encourage our schools to consider uh, this step. I, I want to go to Bruce for a moment before I go to the Lieutenant Governor. I don't know if Bruce is still up there. Bruce, you and I have talked a lot about this, and I wonder if you have just some some comments from the medical point of view about this. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, you know, we, of course, are looking forward to the great effort that we saw uh, around the Thanksgiving holiday from Ohioans, including uh, our students. It, but as we head into this holiday season, Christmas, New Year's, and, and the, the, the get-togethers that uh, you know, families have, we, we know that there, there could be some increased risk that kids being kids may have some exposures and giving it a little more time allows for that space allows for uh, anything that may have occurred not to get carried over into the school year and to really have that start of the second half of the school year be a fresh start 